you have less in your agency's pipeline right now than you did at this point last year? If so, you're probably not alone for one, but even better, there's something you can do about it that doesn't require doing anything spammy or even overly salesy, which you would absolutely hate to introduce into your agency's sales process. Here's what you can do. You can leverage what Dev Basu calls the dead lead reviver. It's a five-step process he and his team have leveraged to revive old deals, add more to their existing pipeline, and close new clients that had previously told them no. Dev's agency, Powered by Search, is an SEO-focused digital agency for B2B SaaS companies, and he completely understands the desire not to be pushy with prospects in your agency's pipeline. At the same time, he shares a very effective, yet surprisingly simple, framework in today's episode that includes five easy steps, a few no-oriented questions, Chris Voss style if you've ever read Never Split the Difference, and just a little HubSpot workflow nerdiness that I know you'll enjoy. All right, let's hear from Dev as he shares where this tactic has actually worked in the past, and then the steps you can implement to find some new pipeline for your agency that may actually be sitting right under your nose. We just won a deal where it's a fairly large size public technology company that came back to us after a year and a half long sort of buying cycle. And we landed them for one of our programs north of half a million dollars a year. And, and it was thanks to the Dead Lead Reviver, which I'll talk about in a second. The other examples are where we keep sending it out to prospects who, again, had engagement at some point in time. Sometimes they open it and they just don't respond. I can think of one where we sent it out. The person on the other side actually responded, engaged with us again. So the in, in and of itself was actually successful, but the deal ultimately didn't go anywhere because like if you're listening right now and you have deals that fall apart at the last stages because your prospect got laid off or funding fell through or the CFO said no, then those are things that this particular strategy cannot help you with. There are different strategies for those. But in terms of actually going from not hearing at all to getting them back on a Zoom call or Google Hangout or whatever it might be to get to chat with them, it works really well. I love that. I think that there are a lot of agencies that are facing some of those things where their key point of contact was laid off or the CFO said no. We can't address every single sales challenge for agencies today, but I do think that there's a big opportunity in that pipeline that went dark or it was closed loss because of bad timing, those sorts of things. So let's dive in to this dead lead reviver framework dev. What is it? When would you use it? And tell us a little bit about how you would execute it. And then we'll we'll go a little further from there. Let's start with the psychology level first. Most of the time, agencies wait for prospects to come to them. It's when they want to buy. And then usually they're run through the paces of anything from a credibility presentation to respond to this RFP to, hey, we want a meeting this Tuesday and it's Monday and you have to scramble to get around. So generally speaking, I would say the norm for most agencies is they sell based off the buyer system for buying. They don't really have a system for selling, which puts them on a, a bit of a back foot. So because that's the norm, one of the challenges with it is anybody who you know, essentially breaks out of the norm is seen as an outlier. And in general, I would say most agencies really work hard to not come across as quote unquote salesy. And as a result of that, because they have a cringe factor associated with it, they don't really put in those systems in place to be able to, in a very systematic fashion, follow up and revive prospects or really guide and shepherd them along the process from getting to know you, which, you know, we call exploratory session to engaging them to finally enrolling prospects into becoming clients as well. And where the dead lead reviver really comes into place is taking somebody who went all the way to the exploring, maybe even to the enrolling session, like it could have been somebody you sent a proposal to, and then you just never heard back from ever again, and you revive them. So it works for prospects who ghost you. It works for prospects who come back as closed loss because they said they're going with someone else or the budget fell through or the timing is not right. And the challenge here is the other element of agencies is you have to, you know, you have to keep on working on attracting, so marketing, you have to keep on working on converting, selling, and then finally on delivery as well. And in that sort of triangle, what ends up happening is most agencies do two out of three well at any given time. And I would say they largely index on delivery as opposed to on marketing and on selling. 
And so what ends up happening is you spend most of your time, especially if you're an agency where the founder is doing a lot of the engagement and the selling to prospects, most of your time is spent with people who are swimming towards you rather than away from you. And as a result, you spend all your time focusing on that and you don't spend enough time focusing on people who said, hey, follow up with me two quarters from now. In fact, most, most agency owners have no system at all even for putting a reminder in place to follow up with that person. And even if the reminder follows up, there's almost like the sense of indigestion that pops up where you're like, what do I say to this person? You know, I haven't talked to them in six months. They probably don't remember me. How do I go about actually re-engaging them? So the Dead Lead Reviver is a process that we put into place, both at Powered by Search, but then also with the agencies that I coach as well. That just kind of takes away all the thinking and some of the pause that happens, and it just plain works. And so let's dive into the nuts and bolts of it. Would that be helpful? Absolutely. I think you teed it up really well. I talked to so many agency founders that are still running the, the sales process and what you said there about not having a process and even getting a little indigestion of, hey, I they asked me to follow up in Q4, but what do I say? How do I do it? Because they don't have a system for it. So I'm excited to get into at least one tactic that they can execute with this framework of the dead lead reviver. So let's get into the nuts and bolts because I think we've got a lot of listeners, Deb, who are kind of sitting forward and say, yeah, what you just described, that's me. Wonderful. Well, let's dive right into it. So the first thing kind of the, from a framework perspective is when we send an email to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, why do we do that? And it's a rhetorical question. It's because we, we expect a response. We, we don't just send emails into the ether hoping for us to never hear from that person ever again. However, when we send this using our marketing automation platforms or email marketing platforms, we optimize for things like open rate as opposed to response rate, which is kind of counterintuitive. The whole point of every email, whether you send it one-on-one, -on -one, you send it automatically, should be to expect a response. So what we really want is a criteria, a litmus test for doing it right is what we call a, a spear email, short, personal, expecting a response, right? And so it's something that imagine if you received on your phone today, most of us are you know, hardwired to open up Gmail or whatever your app is on your phone to look at an email that just popped in. And every time you look it up, you have this sort of response of, I can use my thumb between drinking coffee and something else to respond, yes, no, maybe, or I'm just gonna mark it as unread because that's the other task management system that lot, so many of us have, and then I'll attend to it later. So what you want as an email that is easy to respond to using somebody thumbing between tasks or between different errands in their day to day. And that's the whole point of this email. And so when we're having sales processes with clients or prospects, what we're typically looking for is a few things. You know, what's their situation like right now? So what's their reality? What's the result that they want? Why did they come to you? And then what's kind of getting in the way? What are their roadblocks? So reality results and roadblocks. And what we want to do is if somebody came to you and said, you know, I want to design a new website and that's what they're, and the reality is their current website's kind of old and outdated. The result they want is a brand new web flow website. Okay. And then the roadblock that's getting in the way is that no one actually understands conversion rate principles or user experience to make a better customer journey happen. And let's suppose you put a proposal in front of this person, they vanished, and now it's a quarter later. You might say, are you still looking to launch your Webflow site this quarter? Question mark. So it's only a few words, and that's your email. There's no preamble. There's no, hi, Logan, how's it going? Hope you had a great summer. You know, just checking in again. All that sort of verbal diarrhea is cut out of the email entirely. And generally there's a, a format for this. It's an, are you still email? So for example, we send one automatically and we're in the demand generation business and we help B2B SaaS companies who aren't growing fast enough. So we'll send one that it says, are you still looking for a way to grow your demos and trials this quarter? And it's a type of email where everybody who's growth oriented will reply back and say, yes. No one comes back and says, no. They either open it and don't respond or they open it and say, yeah, what did you have in mind? And what we're, all we're looking for is just a way for people to re-engage, to restart the conversation. Again, it's not a type of, of communication that does the selling for you. It just opens a door that was once closed. So that's one type of email. The other one is where someone says, 
you know, they are expecting a result, like maybe they are launching an event in two quarters, or they are trying to do something for their Black Friday promotion, or they're trying to nail some sort of result that's out in the future. And I call that a have you and then dot, 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 yet email, right? So have you filled your course enrollments yet? If you're setting up somebody's, you know, creator or knowledge management company's course enrollment thing, like maybe you're trying to work for a company like maven.com that does online learning, have you filled your course enrollment yet? And then you might even be specific about the type of course that they reached, you, reached out to you about. The last one, which is really super specific, is effectively, a, is your current agency performing as you expected them to email? So sometimes we get into conversations where there's already an incumbent option or an agency in there. And the prospect says, you know, I'm not really happy with how things are going. They give you a list of reasons why the current agency isn't doing as well as they were expecting them to. And now you are the challenger versus the incumbent agency. The reality is a lot of the times these sales don't go anywhere because uh, it's just easier to do nothing, basically. And so how do you revive that? And so what we want to do over here is effectively send an email like, is agency name putting your leads on autopilot yet? Now, why did I bring that up? It's because in this particular um, instance of an agency owner that I was coaching, their prospect said, I have to continue pushing my current agency every time I need to get a result. What I really want is just leads on autopilot. So we're using the same language that the prospect actually used to write this email. And that's why it's very congruent. We're reminding them of the result that they wanted some time ago, three months, six months, nine months ago, and then going, you made a bet on your current incumbent agency performing as expected. Have they done that? Right? So that's email number three. I'll give you a fourth one as a bonus, which is, I call it a would you like to email. And this is very simple. It just says, would you like to get started on your dash this month? Would you like to get started on your website this month? Would you like to get started on that PPC program we spoke about this month? Would you like to get started on that demand generation campaign we spoke about last quarter? And it's again, a yes or no email. And all we're doing over here is you know, our fundamental perspective on being able to close prospects. A close is not a yes or a no. It's just like eliminating a maybe. And that's the, the reality over here. Like we only want to focus on people who actually have a, you know, a desire of knowing what they want, when they want it, and who they want it from. The people who are kind of on the sidelines about whether they want to do something or not aren't really good prospects, frankly, because it's not just that they don't know that they want your help. They may be talking to multiple different agencies in the market and then choose to do nothing whatsoever. It's just that they're not ready. It doesn't make them a bad prospect. It just means that you should ideally be focusing on your, your time on people who are far more qualified and they see your agency as being meaningfully differentiated. And so that's the why these, these questions are posited this particular way. I love that you mapped the three emails to the three R's there, Dev. We talked about reality, result, and roadblock. I love that alliteration that you need to know in your sales process as an agency regardless, but especially if you're going to revive a dead lead with this framework, you want to lean into those three. And you've given some great examples, plus that fourth bonus one. I, I love that. To be able to speak to each of those three with the email. So for listeners, if you weren't kind of catching that, there's one one email that ties to each of the three R's. Dev, talk to us a little bit about solving for the founder-led sales or just agency sales that don't have this process of when do I reach out? You've spoken to a little bit of how do I reach out, but maybe who do you pick and how do you create a system for sending these three types of emails that lean onto the three R's? And then once you get a yes or a no, taking next steps from there. So let's start with the fact that most of us are fallible. We have limited time in the day. We can't remember to do everything and we're not machines. But thankfully we work with machines. We work with computers that never forget to do something if we only knew how to instruct them. And so part of this is service and sales design. The idea here is, you know, you as an agency owner or as a new business person at an agency should be unaccepting of when a prospect says something like, we're going a different direction. You know, that is a lazy response that most prospects give. And so you can't learn anything basically from that. 
you want to pre-wire it so that it is okay no matter what decision the prospect takes. It's not about you. It's not about your agency or whether you're good at what you do or not. They are simply choosing what they think is the right decision for them at that time. So I'm talking about the psychology over here for a second because often we don't actually get to asking these questions because we're afraid of what the answer is going to be and we're afraid of rejection, frankly. And so what we want to do over here is really come in and go, Every time you're getting close to the point where you know that your agency would be a better fit for that prospect than they know it'll be a good fit, you should make a deal. And the deal is this. Hey, Mr. or Ms. Prospect, look, I know you said you want to make a decision by the end of July, which is when we're taping this. No matter which way this goes, can we just agree that when you make that particular decision, and I'm really hoping that it might be us because I see a really good fit over here, but regardless of which way it goes, you're going to give me some very specific feedback. And trust me, you won't hurt my feelings about whichever way we go, because our sole goal is to be able to serve people like you better for the next time we have one of these interactions. Would that be unreasonable? No one's going to say it's unreasonable. So you, you make that, you know, that particular interaction happen before you send the proposal. Yeah, I just want to pause you right there, Dev, because you're doing two things that I think anybody involved in agency sales should be thinking about. One, you're priming them for the rest of the process. You're asking for that feedback in advance so that when you do ask for it, it's not, oh, do I have enough rapport to ask that? They've already agreed to it. The other thing that it does is it shows them that you've been here before, like that you have been selling your agency services, you've won deals, you've lost deals. And just speaking to that reality shows a little bit like, hey, I've done this before. I'm not a newbie at this and actually instills a little bit of confidence. It's a small little win, but I, I think that that's worth pointing out. And then the last thing I'll say there is the way that you framed that. I want people to really listen to that. Maybe hit the back button if you're listening right now, 15 seconds a couple of times because the way that Dev phrased that is from something that you would hear Chris Voss talk about in Never Split the Difference. You're asking a question intentionally to let them say no because it's easier for people to say no. If I say, you know, would you be okay with that? Then I say yes, but I feel like I'm putting myself out there. But if I ask you, Dev, would that be unreasonable? It's a lot easier for you to say, no, 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 that's not unreasonable. And so that's a quicker way for you to get that confirmation about the feedback that you're going to ask for later. So I just wanted to pause there. Keep going, Dev, because this is fantastic stuff and some very tactical stuff for anybody involved in agency sales right now. Awesome. So now let's talk about your, you've asked this question, you've gotten the prospect to agree to give you feedback no matter what ends up happening from here on out, right? So it's prior to you sending or sharing the proposal. And by the way, small aside, don't ever send a proposal, always walk them through it. But if you are sending proposals right now, you now have agreement that they won't just give you no feedback and leave. Now it doesn't prevent them from ghosting you after the proposal. That's a different talk track, which we can talk about if we want to. But once you have now got a reason of either closed loss or closed one, and they get you an email saying, hey, we chose whatever, a different agency. Hey, we chose to hire somebody in-house. Hey, we're parking this decision for you know whatever period of time. Depending on what they say, it maps differently than what they said that their results, their desired result really was, right? So if they said in the reality right now, you know, things are not that great because either, you know, there's a number they want to hit that they're not hitting. There's a feeling that they have internally that they don't want to feel anymore, or there's a challenge that they have that they need to solve for. And they tell you they want to get to a different number, a different feeling and a different challenge at some point in the future, you now have some ammo to be able to follow up when they reply back invariably, as we're going a different direction, you now just go, it sounds like you've made a smart choice. Now notice what I just said over there, because we're not getting defensives. Sounds like you've made a smart choice. Given what you've told me about hitting this number by that timeline, so you can avoid this particular challenge or emotion, and those are variables in this case, would it be inappropriate for us to, to talk again in 90 days time, which is again, a no, no oriented question. And you get them, they'll come back and they'll all, you know, almost always say, no, no, totally okay, totally appropriate. What you do now is you mark the lead as closed lost in your pipeline and whatever CRM system you're using, and you mark it with a reason. And the reason is going to be 
based off whatever the prospect tells you. So it could be, you know, competitor, budget, internal hire, and these are going to be relatively small map. You want to have consistency in the reasons. Now, this is where we're going to get a bit nerdy. The nerdiness comes from setting up workflows. Now, the workflows are not hard. Even I can do them, you know, and I'm not I'm not a marketing operations pro by any means. We have great people at Powered by Search who like major on that. I'm I like super minor on it. And the workflow is very simple. If the prospect got lost on whatever day is today, three months from today, send them an email and the email is mapped to the close lost trigger, basically. So if somebody says that they took the cheaper route and you know the budget was the issue and they chose a cheaper competitor you might want to send an email associated with that that is a, a a dead lead reviver email, right? And that could be an, is your agency performing as they were expecting, as you were expecting them to right now? So we sent one of these last week out to, uh, and it's automated again. So just remember as a founder, the beauty of it is you set it up once and all you do is field responses that come in. You don't have to worry about it actually going out. You want it to go out from your inbox, by the way, not from some marketing at your agency email, you know, dot com or whatever. It has to be from your inbox, most importantly. And that way, when they respond, you get the respond just like you would, you know, any other email that pops into your, your inbox, right? And so one example of this, which is a slight twist on, an, you know, if somebody chose a different agency, it could be something like Logan, you know, comma, and then the one sentence email is, is your new partner as far as far along as you were hoping them for them to be at this point in time? Question mark. And just play with that. Do play with that type of what we're trying to get to is the emotion of they were frustrated with whatever their prior option was. Around 90 days is a churn point for a lot of different agencies. When they think about new clients coming on board, it's, you know, the, where the honeymoon period is starting to subside. Things are getting real. There's three months of invoices that have been paid conceptually by the client, and they're looking for a result at this point in time. And so it is a great time to insert that seed of, hey, are you as far along as you were hoping to be 90 days in? It's again, it's a yes or no response, right? Yes, we are fantastic. And then you can reply back and say, great, love to touch base with you six months from today, which is nine months into a year long contract. Or no, oh, we should probably talk because we've lost three months of time. Would you like to get started this month with us? And you can actually close right on the email as opposed to going through and resetting the entire sales process from the start. So we like to think about a lot of these processes as a, a Lego block system, like everything connects to everything else. And the dead lead reviver is just super tactical and practical with just this one area of if somebody drops off the face of the earth, how do you bring them back into having a warm conversation? How do, they, how do they go from cold to warm really fast? And how do you do this in an automated way as well? The automation is so key. And also just that visual picture when you're drafting these emails that are gonna be sent out later as you execute this new workflow, if you're gonna put the dead lead reviver to work in your sales process, you've got a picture, something that you said earlier, Dev, your prospect sitting over coffee, pulling up email on their phone just for a little bit to kind of clean out their inbox before they get into a few meetings for the day. How could they quickly tap reply and answer with one thumb, you know, could they swipe to type yes, or could they hit the automated response? No, or whatever the, the case might be. That is, I think the other key to this dev, where do you think some of the agency folks listening to this might still push back because you opened with a, a good common reality that I see in agency sales. We don't want to come across as too salesy, especially those who are involved in orchestrating inbound and content marketing for our clients. We don't want anything to come across as what we've seen as the antithesis to that of hard, spammy, outbound sales. So for anyone who says, yeah, this sounds good, but I don't know if I can execute this and not come across as salesy, what would you say to that? And what would you advise them on how to do it without coming across that way? What I'd say is this, and I don't want to go all Tony Robbins on you about this at all, but just think back to the fact that there was times in your life where you suspended your disbelief and you tried something and you were pleasantly surprised with how well it actually worked. Now, 
one of the elements about any tactic, of course, is that you need to execute it at a high enough threshold level. So I've seen people try the dead lead reviver at a three on 10 level and then not be uh, impressed with the results. That's a little bit like saying I'm on a diet because I want to get in shape. But mostly I just adhere to the cheat days, not to the days that you actually need to work out. So those are the things that if you're doing that at a three on 10 level, it's not going to work for you. The best segment of people to send a dead lead reviver to email to is somebody who's exactly a quarter after their close lost. And so I would start with that and keep it relatively simple, which is just, are you still looking for insert blank, whatever the result that they, they wanted before you start getting fancy with the other three types that I mentioned over here? So, you know, are you still looking for a way to increase your leads from Facebook? Are you still looking for a way to edit your website more easily? In the case of somebody who maybe had a website that they needed their developers to edit, right? Those types of things. So just like a very on the face type of result that the prospect said that they wanted. And I wouldn't even go down the automation path. What I would do as an example, if go into your CRM system, download a CSV file or an Excel file of everybody that was closed lost. You probably remember them because most agencies don't get hundreds of leads per month. So you can probably remember somebody you spoke to 90 days ago, even if you don't have it mapped properly as to why they lost the deal or whatever. Work with somebody else in your agency just to add a reason for group them together and go, you know, this person was lost due to budget, that person went to a competitor or whatever it might be, and send the emails out manually. Don't do it using automation. Wait for the responses to come in. And, you know, on a base of 50 to 100 emails, I would be shocked if you don't get somewhere between a 10 to 20% response rate from those people, either saying a yes, no, or maybe, and don't judge it as this is going to help me make new sales. Just judge it on whether you were able to get a response, because that is the first heartbeat that there's still a pulse in this thing. And then from there, you can go into reengaging the conversation and so on. So that's how I would, I would focus on getting you know, the first step rather than trying to go and do the entire strategy and the tactical fits with the automation. We mostly talk about that so that you can kind of get a 30,000 foot level view. And it, it also addresses other excuses or reasons like I don't have the time to do this manually for hundreds of people. Well, you don't have to, you can use automation for it. But the best way to automate something is to do it manually a couple of times first, really dial it in, and then go and teach the machine, you know, how to run this, if you could rely on yourself to run it all the time, and you never got tired, you never forgot to do things. Such a good shout there. It reminds me, I think it was Chris Ronzio with Trainual who said this when I was interviewing him for another podcast years back. He said, do it, document it, delegate it. So often we want to delegate or these days automate things too soon before we've actually done it and then documented it. And the same goes here, do it and then document the process because you don't want to jump straight to automating something that's not really working or uh, something like that. So I, I think that's a good little aside there. So Dev, what I hear you saying to execute the dead lead reviver is in your sales process, you need to make sure that you're understanding the three R's. What's their reality? What result do they want? And what is their roadblock? You want to get pre-agreement from them early in the sales process to give you feedback at the end. And then when you ask for that, you want to use a no-based question to, again, get kind of pre-agreement to follow up. 90 days is kind of that sweet spot for a number of reasons that you mentioned there. And then when you do follow up, you want to make sure it's tied back to that reason. It's automated if you're to that point but we just said there, you might not want to jump to that. And those are really the steps that I hear you saying, how Dev, do you think someone could maybe follow all those steps and still get it wrong? So let's talk about architecting it and where this could fall through. One of the number one things that I see very often in any sort of consultative sales where there's a considered purchase, I mean, most of us are not selling stuff that's 500 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month. It's, you know, more than that, right? We t sometimes tend to be assumptive where rather than deep listening to the prospect, we assume that as soon as a few words kind of come out of their mouth, that we're pattern matching and that, yeah, we could do that. We did it for this client. We, you know, we've got a case study. Yeah, yeah, we do that all the time. You know, if, so if there's a, some sort of some level of false confidence showing up in the early engagements, what we often do is we write down what we think they want versus what they said they want and also the problem. So there's a challenge here if you write down the wrong things in terms of what their reality is or what the results are or what the roadblocks are. 
So one of the things that we do to get around this with our team is we record every conversation, we transcribe it, so we can always go back to what the prospect actually said. And then we also map it and essentially summarize it. So there's a worksheet we have, plus the fact that we have this prospect conversation. And you're not scratching your head and going, what, what did they talk about again? I, I kind of vaguely remember it, and therefore I'm going to write this email. So that's one area where it could fall apart. Because if, let's say, I'll, get, I'll give you a common one that's probably relevant for 2023. I'm sure a lot of your listeners, Logan, are running performance marketing services. Maybe they're doing SEO or PPC or something of that nature, essentially, and they're running marketing campaigns. Well, in 2021 and 2020, everybody just wanted to scale. They wanted to grow 10x. But that's not the climate we're in right now. So if you send a scaling-oriented message to somebody who said that they want to cut their ad budget by 50%, they're not likely to respond because they're fundamentally what the result is that they want is different than the result that you're selling. And so that's an example of where deep listening and really trying to use the same words the prospect said in their own language can be helpful. And if you don't do that, then you know this, this email will fall you know, on its face. That's one example. The second is, yes, when you do get a response, I would say there's an element of cutting it too short. And so if let's say you had a whole bunch of people saying, no, 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 take me off your list or unsubscribe or something of that nature. If you freak out at that point in time and just go, this is you know, terrible for my reputation, for my business or whatever it might be. And you, you cut it short because you got, you know, a randomized sampling of, you know, a couple of responses, essentially. I would go back and look at what is the email that you, you sent. And just remember that the email is supposed to be fairly innocuous sounding, right? It, it is not some highfalutin offer that you're sending to them. There's no reason for prospects to reply back in any sort of charged way. It's, it's usually going to be a yes, a no, Maybe, but I could take another quarter or no response at all. Those are the typical categories that we've seen this pop in, both for ourselves, but for everybody we've ever taught this to, essentially. The last bit is, you know, if you revert to, again, the prospect system for buying rather than your system for selling, you are setting yourself up for making the same mistake you might have made the first time, but to do it the second or the third time. And so if let's say they say, yes, but let's set up a meeting to go through your agency's history and your credentials and your team and your pricing and send me a deck and send me a case say, you know, all of that type of stuff, that's where you might want to go. We already did all of that. So the next step after you get a response is really to get somebody off email and onto a call. And the first question that you should be asking them is what compelled you to jump on this call? Why now? And you just shut up and let them talk because they will tell you so much more than they wrote back in that email as to what is going on in their world that's changed. And if they say, you know, the timing is better, you can reply back and say, what's changed for you? What's changed for you now in Q2 or Q3 that wasn't true that, you know, held us back from getting started in Q1? And that's going to give you lots of great feedback because now effectively you are turning the tables a little bit where the prospect is selling you as to why they want to get started as opposed to what you're typically used to, which is selling them on why they should choose you. And so that would be the next step that we often see, you know, agencies miss, which is they just kind of go back into server responder mode where if the prospect says, let's dance or jump and you say kind of your condition to say how high, that is where you might, again, concede some of the ability to be a consultant really in the, the relationship as opposed to be somebody who offers a commoditized service. That is where, again, you know, the tactic could succeed, but if the overall strategy is one that still isn't kind of holistic and it doesn't fit together nicely, that could be a place where your, the ball gets dropped. But it doesn't take away from the effectiveness of simply getting somebody to respond and for them to go from cold to warm. Absolutely, because if you are getting them re-engaged, that is definitely a step in the right direction. One tactical thing I wanna advise people on here, it was something I pushed for on our client experience team when I was part of an agency and I advised our sales team to do as well. You get someone on the line, whether it's brand new or it's a dead lead that's been revived in this situation and they say yes, oftentimes it is, okay, well, when do you wanna meet? Or 
or great, here's my HubSpot meeting link. Here's a tactic to remove some of that friction. Go ahead and send them a meeting invite for let's say about a week out. Don't send it for the next day, but look at their time zone. Like Dev, you're in Eastern time in Toronto and I'm on mountain time in Colorado. I'm not going to send you something for 4 PM my time. That's 6 PM yours. Think about your prospects time zone, but just put something about a week out that might work for both of you and say, great Dev, really excited to re-engage and start the conversation again. I sent you an invite for next Wednesday. If that time doesn't work, feel free to decline and pick a new one here and then put in your Calendly or HubSpot meeting link. Just remove some of the friction. As we were talking about earlier, you may kind of bristle at that and say, oh, that seems kind of assumptive or, or pushy, but you're not putting a meeting on someone's calendar that you've never met with. And two, you're not putting a meeting on there that they haven't agreed to in principle. Now you're just figuring out the time and the number of times that I've seen prospects and clients within the agency where I was serving in both sales and CX roles, just accept that it's like 80% where they were like, great, thank you for doing that. You just took, you know, five minutes out of my day where I was going to have to go back and forth or you put it on me to schedule. I also love that you called out dev using call recording in your agency. This technology has become better and better. I just saw Pete Caputa raving about a tool. I had actually hadn't even seen, I think Avoma in this category with gong and wingman and fathom and others, it's becoming more affordable and the capabilities to not only record the call, but transcribe it. And even using some AI to create some notes out of those calls, you know, we talked a few episodes back about how strategic narratives aren't just for B2B SaaS anymore with Mike and Gabby Grinberg. I think that call recording tools aren't just for B2B SaaS sales teams anymore. Agencies really can leverage that, especially in situations like this, where we're not selling just a product. There's nuance to it. As you said, we could hear one thing and kind of interpret it another, but there's just so much benefit in that. Well, Dev, before we get to our final two segments on agency life, I just want to ask you, is there anything about executing this deadline? lead reviver workflow in your agency sales process that we haven't touched on that you want to call out to anyone listening to this, who's kind of itching to put it to work for their agency and maybe generate some pipeline that they wouldn't otherwise in Q3 and Q4. Yeah. Maybe one of the things I would add to reality results and roadblocks is what are you saying to them in terms of your, you know, understanding of their problems. So they say the reality is X, what root cause problem do you think is causing that? I'm going to write down a couple of bullets on that. What is a prescription that you're actually sharing with them? So, hey, I think you need a new website. You probably have a bunch of wasted ad spend that we could do and look at an audit. And what is a promise that you're basically making them, which is usually going to be some sort of result in some sort of time frame without some sort of downside. So it could be scaling from $100,000 to $250,000 in ad spend without you know, completely blowing up your cost of acquisition. It could be moving from WordPress to Webflow to improve your SEO without tanking your current Google rankings. So it's like from here to there without some sort of thing that they fear. It's a useful thing to have in your back pocket because now you have six different boxes, reality results, roadblocks, problems, prescriptions, and promises to be able to write these emails. And they're not just useful for the emails, they're useful just in general for conversations you have with your prospects. In fact, they become even more important once you become a client because in our system, the next step is onboarding. And so, you know, as you're making the handoff from whoever it is that was primarily kind of the point of contact selling the client from the exploring stage to the enrolling stage, they have fears about, oh, am I going to get handed off to the B team or some juniors or whatnot? Having these six boxes is a useful thing for your internal team to know about. So on that kickoff meeting, we've got a very specific process that we run it in, um, in Agency Academy, which is my coaching program for agency clients, where you aren't just showing up and being a, uh, you know, a, a smiley face effectively, right? Stating your name, your kind of area of responsibility, and then you move on to the next person. Um, and you're also not doing something that is on the surface, you know, cute, like what's a fun fact about yourself? What the, what the client needs to really walk away with is I'm working with professionals who have been here and done that. And I am not getting passed off to the intern. That is what they want. They already have that doubt going in. So having these six boxes pre-filled out is a useful thing to have. Um, for anybody who is, you know, slightly having indigestion and at the sort of the negotiated, pre-negotiated question about, you know, no matter which way this goes, I just want to give you a carrot, which is 
you could also use the exact same strategy for when you win a client. So this is something we don't normally don't ask, which is if someone signs a dotted line is getting started with us, what would be really cool to do is, hey, just say, hey, you know what? We're super stoked to get the ball rolling on this. Just out of curiosity, I, I remember, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you were saying that you were looking at five different agencies. What was it about how we showed up in the process that made you choose us? Why us versus everybody else? And if nothing else, it's going to give you something to share in your Slack channel, uh, to share with the team, boost morale. Like there's all sorts of good things that can come from that. And so I think the, the meta lesson that I'm sharing there is that all feedback is good feedback. It can be just asking for it is what really matters. Um, and we often shy away from critical or constructive feedback. And we receive good feedback by default. And this is a system where you can get it by design, no matter which way it goes without being so you know, attached to the outcome. I love that. It echoes something that Jonathan Ewing from APCO mentioned just a few episodes back. Uh, if you really like this one on agency sales, you'll love Jonathan's episode after you hear the fast five from Dev, obviously today as we round out the episode. But one thing he said is you've got to have in your mind, what is the answer to the question around the water cooler or on the Zoom call internally where your prospect or client is being asked, why did you choose this agency? If you know the answer to that, or you at least have some insight into to how they might answer that when you're not on the call, you are better suited to win the deal, keep the client, re-engage them if they ghost you. All three of those scenarios are better when you get some of that feedback. So Dev, I think it's very much in line with what another great guest uh, has shared with our audience here on Agency Life. Well, let's wrap it up as we do with our final two segments every episode here on Agency Life. Dev, number one of our fast five, if someone gave you 10,000 bucks a month to help you better run your agency, no strings attached, where would you invest that extra infusion of capital right now? I mean, since this is a sales focused podcast, I would focus it on marketing more than sales, frankly, to be able to get you lead flow. So $5,000 out of that 10,000, I would focus in on content creation purely at the bottom of the funnel. So what are the pain points of the top five to 10 things that your prospects keep coming, you know, bringing up in conversation about how do you guys do X or what if bad thing Y happens? You should have a blog post on every single one of those questions or objections. And so if you don't have the time to write that yourself, uh, this gives you budget to be able to do that. I would write, you know, somewhere in the range of two to three blog posts a month associated with that and have one of those be a case study where you can basically say, hey, this problem comes up pretty often here is a client that had the exact same problem. We helped them solve this problem using our current system methodology, whatever tactics, and here was a result. And so the next time that particular concern pops up, you can send a blog post to the prospect and say, I'm glad you asked that question. We actually come across it pretty often. Here is how we think about solving that particular problem. Okay, so now we have $5,000 left out of the $10,000 per month. That 5,000, I would focus on distribution in getting it in front of the prospects as best you can. And the best way of doing this is using paid promotion. If you are a B2B oriented agency, this could be spending your time and money on LinkedIn ads or Google DSA ads, for example, to be able to remarket to those prospects, case studies, testimonials, that content that really positions you as differentiated and how you approach XYZ topic area that you solve for effectively, you'll burn through that budget pretty quickly. But $5,000 per month can yield many tens of thousands of dollars of agency retainer if you do this right. And just remember, you're not trying to get people back into another call with you. This is really for the people who have come close to becoming a prospect to get them to become a prospect, but it is also equally important to do it for people who are already in your sales funnel. So if they are in your CRM system right now, don't just rely on automated email or manual email to be the only way to communicate with them. You should be running view only ads to those people at a high frequency. So essentially you become a big fish in their small pond effectively, which is not something that your competitors are probably thinking about. So that's how I would spend $10,000 per month to better run the agency around sales and marketing. I have a different answer. If it's about delivery and operations, $10,000 per month could probably buy you a very good operations person to help you with things as a, if you are a founder listening to this right now, I would put that money into 
the team bucket and look for somebody who would have an integrator's kind of skills overall. But 10,000 bucks, you know, between content marketing and promotion, that's where I would put that money. Logan. Great call out. And I think it ties into the theme of the episode today where you can find some opportunity to generate pipeline where it may be shrinking for you as an agency. Good call out to the integrator potential investment on the upside side if you go there. But we'll go to number two here, Deb. What is one or two of your all-time favorite business books that have helped you as an entrepreneur and an agency owner yourself? A really good one that I keep returning to is a book called The Road Less Stupid. And it's really about having the thinking time that you should have in your business, which you're not spending because you're spending 40% of your work week in your email. It's essentially about asking better questions about figuring out where the point of constraint is in your business and then being able to to grow it essentially from there. Highly recommend that one. That's a good one and not one I've been aware of. So it's got an interesting title and you pulled me in with the little preview there. So I'm adding that to my reading list. I think our listeners will be as well. All right, number three, Dev, what's one mistake you've made in running your agency that you're never gonna forget? In the early days, I've been doing this for 13 or 14 years now. I started the business straight out of, of school um, in university. And I would say one of the bigger mistakes is is really spending time with the C's rather than the B pluses and the A's. And I mean that across both clients as well as the team. The loudest clients, the loudest people, the neediest people, the ones who always have a problem for every solution are the ones that most of us as agency owners spend a little bit too much of our time and attention on. And here's why that's important. It's not that people who raise their hand and ask for attention in and in and of themselves are challenging. The challenge is we actually don't pay attention to the people who are quiet, hardworking, performers, reliable, dependent, you know, somebody we can depend depend on essentially. So this is the client who just pays their bills all the time, who you have never sent a thank you note to because you you take them for granted. Or it's the employee or somebody on your team. It could be an independent consultant or a contractor who just does their job really, really well. They're kind of in the background and you've never sent them a thank you note or a surprise bonus or, you know, given them a promotion before they asked for it. That was one of my bigger mistakes in the early years, which is really just focusing in on not the right set of people that would, that I wanted to spend time with in you know, our vision is doing the work we love with people we like how we want. It's that doing the work with people we like part that I probably should have spent more time on in the early years. And now I, I double down and index on. And it has real impact. I mean, any sales manager can tell you that if they find themselves coaching to the lowest common denominator and trying to bring the bottom performers up a little bit, the net impact to their whole team's results is not as much as if they focused on the top performers to get them from an A to an A plus or an A minus to an A. So I think that's good advice all around. Deb, I want to get to our final two, which are my favorite of our fast five. Number four, what's the hardest part about agency life in your opinion? I think the hardest part about agency life is that there's so many moving parts to it. You know, if you think about even just marketing, selling and delivery, renewals, expansions, getting everybody on the bus at the same time in terms of rowing in the same direction, both clients and team is challenging because ultimately agencies, even if they have technology, are people businesses. And so, again, you need to work so much on the beliefs that band people together more than you do the strategies, the SOPs, the tactics. I've realized that we have built systems and standard operating procedures that everybody nods to and then proceeds to do things their own way. And it's it's fundamentally got nothing to do with the standard operating procedure at all. It's got everything to do with answering the why. Why are we doing this? What problem does it solve? How does it impact you as a person? Why is it gonna make your life better than it is right now? And answering those questions on both sides of both the client equation as well as the team equation is one of the harder parts. It's not necessarily the hard dust. The hardest part overall would probably be just, especially in the last, I would say 12 to 18 months, being able to, as an agency, always do what's right for your people first, rather than just your clients, because the, you know the, your clients are always gonna do what's right for them and their businesses. And as an agency leader, you have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that you take care of your people and you're shielding them from some of the the sort of volatility that's going on in the markets basically as well. And so over communicating 
the health of your business, where you're at, what you're going to do, how you're responding to it is more important because when there are blanks that go unfilled and unsaid, people will insert their own stories and fill in the blanks that particular way. And so it's really, really important to be able to over communicate in war times as opposed to in, in peace, peace times, for example. So that would be one of the hardest parts. That's a really good shout. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to relearn that lesson about over communicating both in work and in life, but that's another podcast episode in and of itself. Dev, we want to round it out with number five. What's the best part about agency life in your opinion? I think the best part is just seeing your people win even more than clients at the end of the day, because, you know, when clients win, one of the interesting things about the agency business versus, let's say, a coaching business, and, and I run both, so I can speak to both. Clients kind of see their wins as somewhat deserved effectively because they're paying you hopefully top dollar for those results. So they almost see it as, you know, somewhere between deserved to an entitlement. Your people never see that. So the best part about it is seeing people learn and grow and whether that's crawling through the mud and then emerging victorious or just taking good bets and really gaining confidence in, them, in and of themselves as a result of that, that just puts a big smile on my face. And so, you know, seeing somebody succeed and seeing teams succeed at work and then seeing good work that gets appreciation is probably one of the, the better parts of running a business like this. It's kind of when we got into it because we have skills and traits, but we are at the end of the day in service to people. And if we see those people succeed both on the, the team side and on the client side, I, I can't think of a better outcome for an agency founder to kind of go, look, look at what we built together. And it's way more look at it, you know, what we built together than look at what I built. I mean, frankly, most of you, including myself, aren't doing the work with clients anymore. Um, and so it's really celebrating the team when they end up winning really good call out there. And on that note of calling out, we want to end this episode like we do everyone here on Agency Life and Dev, give you the opportunity to give someone a shout out. Who do you want to call out who has impacted your agency life for the better? I would say Marcel from Parakito. He's been a really good friend and, and confident, you know, running the, the agency business, especially around the financial elements of it, which can be sometimes dry and boring for agency owners. So I'd give him a, a shout out in terms of being right there with me uh, while we've been building this business over the years. Absolutely. For those who want to check out more content from Marcel, if you go to teamwork.com slash agency life, he did a, a great session with a few other panelists on the value-based pricing myth and how you can actually think about the different ways you want to structure your pricing model and how that impacts the way that you talk about your time and set up your contracts with your clients. So it was actually Marcel that connected you and I, Dev, and I can just uh, echo that. I really appreciate it. He takes some sometimes boring topics and makes them digestible and entertaining for agency folks. And he knows a lot of great folks who are in the space such as yourself. So I'm really glad he connected us. And speaking of connecting, as we round it out today, Dev, for anybody listening to this who wants to connect with you as a peer or learn some of the ways that you're serving other agencies, in addition to what you guys are doing at Powered by Search, what's the best way to stay connected with you? Probably just on LinkedIn would be great. So if you search Dev Basu on LinkedIn, you'll find my profile over there. Uh, DMs are open. Love to connect with other agency owners. And if you want to learn a bit more about Powered by Search, poweredbysearch.com. If you want to learn more about the work um, that I do with agency owners, milliondollaragency.coach is the website. Looking forward to connecting with all of you. Awesome. Well, Dev, thank you so much for being our guest today. I think everybody is going to take something away from what you laid out in the Dead Lead Reviver. I think this workflow can definitely help some agencies right now who are seeing shrinking pipelines, trying to find some ways to bring more in the door. You laid out some very specific steps that people can follow, and I appreciate you being willing to connect with more of the community as well. So thank you for being our guest today. It's been such a joy and pleasure. Thanks again for having me.